Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com. Uh, attending the retreat. Uh, this is my first time being able to concentrate on yoga um, for long periods of time, and I met a lot of phenomenal women. Um, so I'm very thankful for this experience, and now I'm able to take some of the things I learned back into my regular life. My experience at the Black Women Yoga Retreat was amazing. It was everything that I could imagine, everything that I needed. Um, even though I traveled here with friends, I made 17 plus other friends here. My experience here at the Yoga Retreat for the Women of Color has been awesome. I've met so many different people, so many different light souls um, that are looking for um, their way, the way. And I think for a lot of them, it has opened up a whole different world, especially within the yoga world. yoga in a place that um, is fairly white female dominated um, and a lot of times like the vibe and the sentiment is really about like the workout and the look and like the very like very superficial aspects of, 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 of practice and um, but I know that's not what yoga is about um, and so it was really refreshing for me to come here and just like you know first night I arrived and I looked through the descriptions and the theme was really about decolonizing yoga so like you know, acknowledging the fact that this is like a 6,000 plus year old practice that um, is not rooted in any sort of Western tradition. The Yamas and the Niyamas. Uh, that workshop was actually very informative for me. That's one of the things that I started to study in my practice off and on for about six months to a year. So um, looking at the yamas specifically, I only really got through the first four, I believe. And it's interesting to see how much I've grown since I started practicing yoga, started practicing the, the yamas, and realizing that you know, I'm thinking that I'm not practicing because I'm not doing anything physically, but through the workshop, through talking with some of the other women, it actually opened my eyes to the fact that I walk spirituality every day, and it's not something, it's something that I do effortless now, and I know I used to attach myself to so many different things, so many different ways to live, and not realizing that I'm already whole in where I am right now. And just looking at the, the yamas and the niyamas kind of just opened my eyes to see where, how much further I can go, where I can look at my life and 
not necessarily correct the things that I'm doing, but make it better in a sense. context of white supremacy Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy today's date Tuesday April 3rd 2018 so I have been told since we have not this is the first time we've been on the air since Saturday I did want to take a moment to recognize the passing of Winnie Mandela, just to pause for someone who I had a great deal of regard for, who I think devoted her existence uh, to fighting against racism, white supremacy in an exemplary manner. Uh, Just pause to appreciate uh, her contributions to solving the problem. Winnie Mandela. Context of white supremacy. We will have more to say about her transition and what's been said the past few days. We'll have more to say about that as the week unfolds. Uh, We should be here on Thursday for Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Tune in live. Looking forward to solving problems, sharing counter-racist suggestions. Uh, The broadcast for today was suggested by a listener Uh, When my house flooded uh, in December of 2017, still displaced as a result of that traumatic episode, uh, I told listeners in, I guess, about the month and a half that we were off the air uh, when I was dealing with, you know, the crazy housing situation and everything else. I returned to doing a lot of yoga uh, because it was such a stressful situation. I was looking for anything nourishing, replenishing. Uh, because of all of the the trauma that I was dealing with and just going back and doing tons and tons of yoga, uh, including today, uh, has been really, really helpful and just sticking with it for the past three months now uh, since the flood. Three, yeah, it's been three months, uh, but I've been talking about it on the program. Some of the experiences that I have had doing yoga in white dominated in environments, spaces, and some of our listeners uh, recommended our guest for today's program. Uh, thought that it would be great. Uh, they have dealt with some of the exact same issues. Uh, in fact, you can go to their website, uh, Women of Color Healing Retreats dot com. Uh, excellent information. Uh, anybody. If you are a black female, if you're interested, uh, if you have a wide array of interests, if you're interested in traveling, if you want to go uh, check out some place maybe you haven't been before, if you want to work on your Spanish, if you're interested in yoga, if you want to network with other black females from around the globe, go check out Women of Color Healing Retreats dot com. Uh, but one of our listeners uh, recommended then I go check out the site, maybe have them uh, on the program. Thought that I would be really eager to chat it up with them about yoga and racism. Certainly was reached out and they were willing to speak with us. Super excited to learn more about the retreat and why this was started. I guess the preface before we get too deep into things, uh, the Wi-Fi is not quite the best. Hopefully It will cooperate and we won't have any issues, but uh, the Wi-Fi is not quite the best. So if there are any technical issues, if you can be patient, hang in and we'll try to resolve things as quickly as possible. But that said, uh, joining us live from Costa Rica, our guest, uh, Satya X. Uh, Satya, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing a bit of your time with us. So excited to have you on the program to talk about uh, the retreat and the work that you're doing. Uh, Just for our listeners, I'm sure this is a lot of folks. This is their first time hearing from you. Uh, Just anything briefly that you would like to share to let listeners know who you are and a bit about the work that you do. Yeah, so my name is Safia X, and I am the creator of Women of Color Healing Retreats here in Costa Rica. It's a space dedicated to black women healing through the practice of yoga, wellness, veganism, self-care. And we also have a free program for kids of color in New York City where we provide free yoga classes to kids in underserved communities. 
uh, throughout the summer um, to provide them basically, I'm sorry, to provide them basically free yoga classes. Wow, spectacular. Uh, folks, we have listeners in the New York area. Check out the website. Might be some information that you want to seek out. Uh, it seems obvious at this point, but just we ask everyone, you are a black female. Is that correct? I am a black person. I, I feel as though gender isn't real, so I identify as a, a black person. Oh, okay. Black person. <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, this program, uh, I use the term racism and the term white supremacy as synonyms. Uh, I use the same definition for both terms, and the definition I use is as follows. A, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you think such a system exists? Uh, do you think that definition is accurate? I think that definition is accurate. It's definitely an accurate and uh, definition. Hmm, okay. Like it when it's concise. We could proceed. Uh, <laughs> you did not start out uh, on the planet in Costa Rica. Uh, you expatriated to Costa Rica. What about your experience in the United States led you to uh, exiting? Well, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, before gentrification. Um, and I just noticed this pattern of white people coming in, you know, black people weren't able to afford to live in their homes. I would see my friends having to pack up and leave and white people hopping out of U-Haul trucks and moving into these low income communities that were being built up specifically for them. And I got sick of things like that, seeing that throughout my life. And I just got sick of systemic racism and just everyday blatant racism that many people don't pick up on. And so one day I was going on vacation and my boss basically fired me. And I said, well, I'm not going to stay in this country. It doesn't make sense. So I packed on my bags. And the next day I went to Costa Rica and I just never left. And it was basically the best decision I ever made. Wow. We have talked about that with workplace racism. I did mention that where uh, just trying to get a vacation can be all kinds of difficult. Like, wow. So I think I've even heard that before where just trying to ask for vacation and ends up being a permanent one. But wow, that, yeah. that seems like a courageous decision to walk away from a stable. Did you like were your family and friends like, yeah, right on, Satya, good job and let's do it. Or were they not supportive? Well, in the beginning, I think that most people were supportive, but then it became, okay, but when are you coming back? And I think that some people weren't supportive of it anymore. And it just, it came from a place of fear because most black people are terrified of letting go of their oppressors. And so it was just a, a place of fear of like, what are you going to do if you're not in the United States? What are you going to do if you're not working for a white supremacist? Like, how are you going to survive? And I just went with my ancestors in spirit and I stayed and everything worked out. Wow. How did you pick Costa Rica specifically? Costa Rica was a very random choice. My friend is from here and I was going to either come to Costa Rica or go to Mexico. And I had a friend that was just basically like, don't go to Mexico, just go to Costa Rica. And that was it. It was a very, very, very organic, random choice, but it was definitely meant to be. But a lot of people, what I do want to talk about is that it's not, Costa Rica is a European country at the root, but I live in the Caribbean. So I live with all the black people. I would never in my life, you know, it wouldn't make sense for me to go to another country to live amongst all white people. So I live with um, all the black people. Wow. So for our listener, including myself, uh, who have never been to Costa Rica, uh, can you kind of give us an idea of these, this environment that you went down, checked it out and said, wow, this is a place, your friend's advice as well. This is a place where I do not feel the racial oppression that you felt in New York. Can you give us just kind of a, a 
as as best as you can a vivid description of the place where you are yeah well when i got to costa rica i remember i was in customs and they asked me to write down where i was from all of these things and i remember saying you know talking to them and saying that i was black and they were like no you know in costa rica you're not black you're just like this person and that was a cool idea and if you would have asked me this question years ago i would have said you know there's no racism here but realistically after traveling to so many different countries and seeing so many different things the entire world is anti-black anywhere you go there are black people and black people are the most oppressed people hands down anywhere you go in a second world country or a third world country so i'm not going to say that costa rica is this angelic place because it's not but you do feel racism a bit differently and you feel it less and at the same time, it's because it, it's kind of swept under the table, but also because it's not as brutal. So it's just this, it's a mind game, you know, but everywhere you go, hands down, it doesn't matter where you go, it is going to be an anti-black place because the world is built on our blood. Wow, that is informative. I mean, that is... Definitely not good news, but I always appreciate getting <laughs> accurate information about, you know, the problem that yeah, we are working. <laughs> problem that we're trying to solve. That's how you solve it with accurate information. So I'm just trying to understand. Can you give us like an example? You said it's kind of swept under the table. It's not as as brutal as what you were experiencing here in the States. So have you you yourself? Have you been a victim of racism since you've been in Costa Rica? Well, I have, but it's been by, you know, white Americans and Europeans that are here because they basically come in and they've colonized the country. Um, the Caribbean is just so beautiful, so much culture, so many black people, but they are building up on it. And they're just, you know, acting as though the, the black people there don't exist. And another part of it is that in Costa Rica, um, Black people weren't allowed to leave the Caribbean until about 1945. They wouldn't allow black people to leave the Caribbean. So they weren't allowed to go to the Pacific side or to the other side of the country um, here. So there's, and Marcus Garvey used to live here in the Caribbean and he left um, because he was sick of racism. He started a small newspaper here and he had left because he was just sick of dealing with racism here. So. I mean, it, it has its it has its ups and downs for sure. Wow. Uh, what what uh, town are you in specifically? Um, Limon. OK, is that like a larger city or is that a more rural? It's, environment? it's the city, but I basically am in Puerto Viejo, which is the Caribbean. Um, it's extremely beautiful. I love Costa Rica for the nature. It's one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen. It's so vibrant. You know, coconuts literally are falling off the tree while you walk down the street. It's it's paradise. Um, and so that's how the Caribbean is here. Wow. Okay. And so where you are, do you see uh, whites on a regular basis or is it mostly black people where you are? I see mo I see black people all the time because I make it my duty, but I see white people every single day. Um, they own most of, so it's the Caribbean, but yet there are like Italian bakeries being built up, um, hairdressers by white people, like just random things that they've come in and set up shop. So you definitely see them. You definitely, you know, when you want to rent a, a house or buy something that's who you're going to the people the local people aren't really aware of the politics of anti-black practices so white people come in and disguise themselves as investors and then they pay these people here a small amount of money they buy up their land and then they take over and colonize and i mean this has been history and it just continues to happen I feel like I've heard that before. That sounds so familiar. Uh, white usurpers. Yeah. And somebody just said something about gentrification, I thought. Anywho, uh, you <laughs> mentioned that that was a staple of what you wanted to do with women of color healing retreats is black land ownership to not just have this facility and have it be outside the states and have this be something that's 
a healing, uh, nourishing experience for Black females, but also the land ownership component. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I feel as though um, that watching gentrification and being and uh, you know the world being colonized. I feel it's extremely important for black people to own land because land is everything. You know, you can have all the money and all these materialistic things that don't even matter. But if you don't have land, you do not have anything and you will not acquire generational wealth. And uh, like, that's just the key to things. So I felt it was very important for us to have a physical safe space for us to, um, you know, heal and practice self-care within our own community. And just also because I've had an experience of working within a white space, a white yoga studio, and it didn't feel good. And so I said, it has to come down to it being, this is a black owned space, the whole property, the land, the people that work here, everyone that walks into the building needs to be a person of color for it to feel like a safe environment. You cannot heal in an environment that has made you sick. Context of white supremacy. Uh, joining us live from Costa Rica, our guest, Satya X. Uh, definitely want to get to your experience working in the studio, but that is spectacular, the land uh, ownership component. And again, you cannot heal uh, in an environment where you don't feel safe, you're being attacked. We've talked about that consistently mm-hmm. in a lot of different School context, work context, a lot of different hospital context, medical apartheid, a lot of different uh, arenas. Uh, So how long has uh, the retreat, Women of Color Healing Retreats, how long has this been in existence? We've been working on it for about four years now. And it's just been an entire journey. It started off where I was going to only do one retreat. And then I saw this need of black women really needing this space outside of the United States. And I said, well, it's done so much for me leaving the country. I learned so much about myself um, leaving and just unpacking anti-blackness. And I just wanted to spread that. I grew up, though, my father is in the nation of Islam. And so I grew up with certain teachings, but I lost them along the way. And so leaving the country allowed me to get back into, you know, unpacking a lot of things. Did you grow up vegan? No, I didn't. I wish. (laughs) Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Okay. Uh, With, I guess I want to touch on some of the yoga aspect uh, of this as well, and then connect that back with the racism. But I guess to start all of that, we talk about the importance of definitions on the program I already gave the definition of racism. In fact, if I can pause one second, I'll remember because I was talking about definitions. If I can just pause one second, speaking of definitions for listeners, if you remember uh, Cheryl Moses, shout to Cheryl Moses, love to Cheryl Moses. Uh, but we were talking about uh, black people being experts on racism. I just want to make sure that we do not miss that point that our guest uh, Satya X said that the black people in Costa Rica they don't seem to understand racism, white supremacy enough to grasp that these white invaders are coming in and stealing their land uh, and giving them a few nickels. She said that they didn't understand that to me would seem to suggest a global pattern of black people not being experts about racism that I do, just like I said before, sad, nothing to be proud of, but we do need accurate information to solve this problem. Now back to Mm -hmm. definition, yoga. What do you mean, Satya X, when you say yoga? When I say yoga, I mean the connection of mind, body, and spirit. That's basically what yoga is. So it's basically life. Yoga is how you move within the world. It's how you navigate. It's how you react to things. It's how you handle things. It's how things come at you. It's spirit. Yoga is everything comprehensive wow okay so you were doing yoga before you got to costa rica yes i was meditating more before i got to costa rica i didn't like yoga when i first started when i first practiced i was just like i had gotten hit by a motorcycle and i couldn't walk yeah and i couldn't walk and my friend was like i I was like i want to practice yoga and so we would just practice every day And I wasn't into it. And then I eventually 
got into it because I started practicing with this teacher and she didn't really, she never talked through the class. So I was able to just learn my body, follow my breath. And then I fell in love with yoga when I started learning more about the spiritual practice. And that's the problem with yoga today is that everyone thinks that it's just as, that it is a fitness, but it's not fitness. Yoga is a spiritual practice. And I fell in love with it when I learned that part about it. Wow. Where you said uh, it was a specific teacher who didn't do a lot of talking and just kind of allowed you to learn your own body. Was that a white teacher or a non-white teacher? That was actually a white woman. But what I learned, (laughs) because, you know, we're always learning. What I learned from her was that she was an awful teacher. This was because it was in the beginning. You don't have a student practice with you and you don't you don't not you have to adjust them. You have to tell them, you know, how to work with their breath. You have to teach them about pranayama. You have to teach them about the chakra. She didn't teach me anything for such a long time. But I know the way that my mind works. So it was like perfect for me to begin yoga. And I was forced to learn through her because there were no black teachers around. Mm. I know the fee, or actually, I can't even truthfully say that. I told listeners that was a part of my talking about yoga uh, so much that actually here in Seattle, when I lived in California, that was the case. I never had non-white instructors, never had a black instructor. But since I've been here in super white Seattle, I have had lots of black instructors, male and female, uh, non-white. I had a non-white instructor uh, today. In fact, every day this week, I've had uh, a non-white uh, instructor like they have great. lots of it and I was telling listeners it has made such a monumental impact uh, when mm-hmm. you are doing yoga or really doing anything where you have an instructor and you get feedback and they say your name and are giving you yeah. attention and adjustments it makes such a huge difference in terms of how you feel about the practice, the learning, the enthusiasm that you have about that. I mean, it's huge as opposed to going and in fact, I can even give a story. I'm not trying to hog the time. I just want to give a story. I think you might be able to appreciate. Mm-hmm. I start, I restarted my practice on December 26th, 2017, after the flood, December 26th, I go to the class. There are exactly three people in the class myself the instructor white man instructor is a white woman three people we do an hour class she does not say a word to me in a class with exactly two students she goes over she gives the white guy adjustments and it's oh you're a little off here try this boom boom nothing not a word not even from like 10 yards away like oh wait a minute you know to yeah just move over nothing not a problem i wasn't stunned like i said when i was in california that's what i expected but that has a huge for a lot of people that right there would be enough to be like this sucks i'm never going to do this again and the practice of yoga is something that can be a huge benefit but racism unfortunately if you don't have access to non-white instructors racism can totally obliterate your connection to the practice and i think the reason i wanted to share that is because i think that is very common for a lot of black people that do yoga and are stuck white spaces white instructors can you comment on that no i i completely completely agree and i feel the same exact way um you know i keep seeing these these ads and posts and articles on diversity and inclusiveness in yoga and i'm just over it because i'm like listen this is a 6,000 year old plus practice that was started by African people because whether you believe that yoga started in Africa or you believe that it started in India, at the end of the day, Indian people are African. So it's an African practice. Now we are here in 2018 begging for a seat at the table to be included in a practice that is ours. That's a problem. And to me, um, you know, all of these conversations about diversity and inclusiveness in yoga. If people want to take it serious, then make it. I don't agree with affirmative action, but maybe they need to do that in yoga. If you have a registered yoga school under Yoga Alliance, then there needs to be a certain quota where you need to have a certain amount of people of color that work within your studio. You know, I feel as though 
if we need to have a conversation about diversity and inclusiveness, then you know that your establishment is built under systemic racism and that's a problem. And I think that is so upsetting because yoga is a tool that can really, really help black people to heal in anything we need. We're working with the nervous system, you know, we're not, it's not a game, like we're working with our nervous system. So whether you want to heal or not, it's, you're going, you're going to heal through yoga. And it's so unfortunate that white people have attacked us in another way, you know? Context of white supremacy. Joining us live from Costa Rica, our guest, Satya X. Uh, you were talking about some of the massive benefits. I was telling listeners, uh, just gabbing away, that's how you ended up here about yoga and how beneficial uh, it's been for me. For some of our listeners who might their only experience, and even that's another part of white supremacy racism is because I think for most people, because of white supremacy, their immediate association with yoga is not what you said about Indian people, African people, black people creating this practice thousands of years ago. Their entire like conceptualization and framework of yoga is white, probably specifically a white woman, uh, but certainly someone classified as white. And they would think this is not this is something that has nothing to do with me and I don't want to do this. And, you know, that's just for whites. If you were to explain to a black person like these are like five concrete things, concrete ways that doing yoga has been beneficial in my life, what would you tell them? Uh, OK, five concrete things that yoga it has allowed me to really, really, really um, connect with myself and with spirit. I think that yoga has allowed me to also heal any form of stress that I have. So if I feel extremely stressed, I know it's because I'm not practicing. If I am within my practice where I am practicing every single, I, well, for me, I like to practice five times a week, six times I used to do, but I felt like it was too much on my body. So I like to practice five times a week. So if I fall out of that practice and I become stressed, I know it's because I'm not practicing yoga. So it's allowed me to do that. It's also allowed me to just look at racism completely different. Um, and it allowed me, I used to be really, really upset about it. And it allowed me to just be not content, but more understanding of it. Um, what else is yoga? Yoga changed my entire life. Um, I don't know. I just give thanks to it every day. Wow. That's amazing. And the stress component, that is, a, in fact, yeah. I want to make sure I highlight that because we talk about black mental health and stress mm -hmm. all the time on this program. And I think a lot of black people directly, indirectly are talking about that all the time, talking about hypertension and being overweight and diabetes mm -hmm. and all of that is connected very much in my opinion. Um, oh, that's interesting. I'm so sorry. Um, yoga is what made me want to be vegan. I was a vegetarian for 13 years. I was a vegetarian. And when I was practicing and practicing and practicing, I started practicing more of Hatha yoga. And Hatha is more about the physical body, the physical practice. But they tell you in Hatha yoga that um, in ancient Hatha, they eliminated dairy, um, stimulants, meat, anything that was unhealthy for the body was a toxin. And so you use asana to basically release those toxins. And it made me, it literally just woke me up to veganism. Yoga is so healing, you know, and meat and dairy are the leading causes of disease in black communities. That's how they kill us. If they can't kill us when we're just walking down the street, you know, minding our business, they're going to try to do it through the food. And so that's why black people are so addicted to fried chicken, to dairy, to cheese, because white people have literally tried to program our brain cells through the food that they give us. And so yoga allowed me to just eliminate all of those things and go completely vegan. And like the way that I see food now is if, if it's made by, if it's not made by, uh, and I'm sorry, but if it's made by a white person, I don't eat it. And what what the what I do now is I'm just vegan, you know, so I eat from God. I eat from the earth. And it's because of yoga. Oh, that is beautiful. Music to my ears. Beautiful. And and listeners, I think, can confirm when I restarted my yoga practice. 
I regressed to veganism at the exact same time. Um, nice. Man. And the health, and I told listeners so many benefits. When I was originally doing yoga in California, I was only doing it because I ran like a savage. I ran all the time every day and I did distance running. So I was just looking for something to stretch my legs. That was the only reason that I was doing it. I didn't want to learn about it. I didn't know about the sutras or anything. It's just stretch so that I can run more. And it like dramatically improved my running practice. Like I just oh, became I heard about that. phenomenal. Uh, I became a phenomenally better runner just because of stretch. Oh, just everything it it did it was so many benefits uh because of doing yoga to the running and uh this time just the stress relief and everything like huge fan of yoga i would definitely encourage folks to do it whether you go to a studio or try it on your own like incredible uh when you talked about your experience working in a yoga studio with a white woman uh can you <laughs> tell how how racism kind of ruined that experience um. You know, white people just, it was just, it was just a horrible experience. I think that any black person, though, working, whether a black person is working a nine to five, whether they're working in a yoga studio, whether they're freelancing for a white company, it's hell and it's hectic. You have to, you have to put on a different face. And so just watching the way that they would, you know, just disrespect the culture, you know, and then also just pick and part, pick and pull certain parts of the practice that they wanted to implement and the things that they didn't agree with, they just kind of just toss it to the side. And that is not how you practice yoga. If you're doing yoga, you need to honor the entire practice. We're not gonna know everything about yoga because there's so much to know but what you know, you have to honor. And so they would just decide, you know, we're not going to do this. Or they would implement things like tennis balls into yoga classes. And I know that if we were in India, we would be kicked out or banned from the class for implementing tennis balls to, to break up our, um, our, our tissues, things like that. And so I'm very, very, very specific with yoga. I'm just, I'm a yogi. Yoga is my whole life. And I believe in if we're going to do anything, then we need to follow the ancestral practice. Of course, our ancestors made mistakes. And so that's why we're here today to basically, you know, learn from them, but also help them in a way where we teach them what we know now. But I believe in respecting the ancestral practices of things, which is always African. And so um, these yoga studios, these white yoga studios, they don't do that. They don't follow the, they won't follow the traditional hatha or sangha. And that's why so many people, they, they, they go to these classes and they think that yoga is not for them, but the teacher or that class is not for you. These teachers are making up sequencing that don't make sense. You know, I had a teacher that would say, you know, go into halasana in the beginning of the class without telling us to warm up our body. That is completely dangerous. There was a teacher that told us to do inversions on the beach in the sand in the beginning. You know, just things like that. And it's just careless white people being violent and doing what they've done throughout history. So, um, yeah, that's just been my experience. Wow. Wow. Well, if, I, if I could, uh, I guess, question with the tennis balls, uh, what, what would your response be to people who say, well, you know, things... Uh, evolve and you can have respect for the well not that whites have shown any respect for the answers not saying that but yeah. uh, that you could certainly uh, you have upgrades right and you yeah you no, I get that I get that but I think that those upgrades need to be by people of color I think that if we're going to change things, then we need to change our own practices or else it's just an appropriation it's just colonizing it's just all of the things that we fight against every single day um, but I understand that part of it, you know, and I mean, I've sat in certain classes that were very, very Western. I'll practice some acro yoga. I definitely will. And it's such a white practice. It's by this white couple. Um, and so you just have to be mindful of it. But I have a problem because guess what? Yoga is good as it is. We do not need to actually change it. You know, that's the beauty of yoga. It's an ancient practice that heals people and continues to heal people every single day. We don't have to go and jump in and modify the practice. Yoga is perfect as is. Absolutely. And with the uh, appropriation, uh, white theft of yes. black practices, uh, the class that I took yesterday 
It was mm-hmm. a substitute. Normally, it would have been a non-white instructor, but she was out of town. They had a substitute, of course, white woman. Not just a white woman, a white woman that was born in Germany, no less. She <laughs> played a Sanzula during Shavasana. Man. <laughs> For people who don't know what a Sanzula is, if you know what a thumb piano is, a uh, little gadget, uh, I, I can't simulate the sound effects it's very unique but a thumb look it up if you are near your phone or what have you thumb piano it's a thumb piano on top of like a drum head uh so it gives a slightly i mean you can recognize it immediately as oh that sounds like a thumb piano but it's a little different because it's on it i mean to- that did not come from Germany. No German person, Hitler and company, <laughs> did not make that device, unless I have been greatly misinformed. On the one <laughs> hand, I was like, wow, that is amazing. At a yoga, because most of the time, that's not it. They're playing Drake and, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, that, at least the classes that I've been to, that's what they're playing. Mm-hmm. Like, it's rowdy, it's party, like, uh, it's all over the place. To have a thumb piano, like, wow that seems way closer to what yoga should be but it was a white german like (laughs) it was i was very incongruent very very incongruent about the whole every even had i'm so ignorant i had to go ask her i didn't even know what it was like what i knew it was a thumb piano or something close to a thumb piano but at any rate uh white women yoga lots of conversation around racism we have listeners if you have questions the number six four one seven one five three six four zero the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate Uh, and in fact i don't know uh red in nevada uh, she participated in the discussion when I was running my mouth about yoga and she said that she went to a practice. She had a white female instructor and the the I'm going to say this racist woman was very insistent with her like, no, your body has to be in this position. You have to be exactly here. And she kept doing it and kept doing it. And it just ruined her experience. And she stopped practicing again. I think that's, yeah, that's sad. Just can you talk about that form of regression? Did you ever experience that in any of the classes that you took with white people? Let me see. I mean, I've experienced where I've corrected a white teacher and they basically brought it back to yoga. What a lot of white yoga teachers like to bring things back to or yogis would say um, is that yoga is for everyone. And that and that allows them to think that they can eliminate that this is a practice by people of color. So I've seen that happen a lot. I haven't really experienced an aggressive, oh, I have experienced an aggressive yoga teacher and I walked out the class. I really, yeah, I I will walk out of a class. You know, I will not allow myself to be disrespected in that way in yoga by a white person. I will just walk out of the class. I've had classes where I felt as though the the music was too loud because I have a problem with um, music within yoga because if we were to really, really go to India or to practice traditional yoga, nobody is playing music within the class because you, music actually um, kind of interrupts your practice. You're supposed to be listening to your breath throughout the entire practice. And so with yoga, you are supposed to be challenging yourself to have your mind silent, you know, to connect mind, body, and spirit. It is supposed to be a challenge. And with uh, music, a lot of yoga teachers like to use music as a like as a way to um like a space filler you know for the classroom or to make the class seem even more interesting but really the students shouldn't there shouldn't be any music in the class so if the music is too loud because most people practice with music which is like fine but i have a problem with it so if the music is too loud i'll say something and the teachers you know they'll get offended and things like that and a lot of white yoga teachers also have a habit of playing things like the beetle or poppy music that they like um there was this one teacher here in costa rica and he said you know today we're gonna have hip-hop yoga and if you don't like it you can leave <laughs> like i'm out of here <laughs> so um yeah it, it's just an interesting practice and don't get me wrong some teachers are amazing but you keep going to that same white teacher over and over and you go deeper into your own practice and you also 
know your African history, you're going to want to get out of that class and find a person of color to teach you. And that's why I say it's so important for these yoga studios, for these diversity and inclusive conversations to just stop and for it to be a real, real demand where if you own a yoga studio, then you need to have a certain amount of people of color working throughout your studio so that we don't need to search for people that look like ourselves for a practice that we started. Mm, absolutely. It makes a, a huge, huge difference uh, yep. having... And our bodies are different. You know, I've had that experience. Our bodies are different. Black people, we have different bodies. We have different shapes. We have different curves. We have different back curves. And so when these white teachers, they make certain adjustments, they don't realize our bodies are different. And like in our retreats, our teachers are stellar because they know how our bodies work. Uh, but so that's why representation is very, very, very important in yoga. Mm. I was going to add another moment of aggression, what I labeled uh, white aggression in yoga. But just for context, I wanted to ask just uh, your perspective in terms of core, the abdominals. How important is that in your practice of yoga? Goodness, it's so important. <laughs> It's so much. Core is everything. Core is everything. It's everything. I've had a weak core and I've had to build it all the way up. Because if you don't have core strength, you're not going to really be able to get these inversions. You're not going to be able to really do plank. There's so many asanas you're not going to be able to do. So core strength is really important. And you can build it up. You know, that's what's so beautiful about yoga. You can start and not be flexible at all. And yoga is going to bring you flexibility. And that's a, one of the problems is that when we see yoga in the black community, we see it as like this competition or like people are more flexible and things like that. But it's like, no, yoga is for every single black body walking. And it doesn't matter if you know how to stretch, if you know how to do anything, you, you don't need to. The practice is going to bring you everything you need. Absolutely. <laughs> that, uh, our people love us, but we 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 do a lot of damage to yoga as far as how it's being represented. And I, you know, and we have to be honest about that. You know, we can't participate in watering down our own practice. Mm, you see a lot of that in terms of making it uh, competitive, like who's more flexible or who can hold plank longest. Yes, or yeah, I see that, and I see just a lot of ego-based practices. I see, um, basically, you know, people are dancing in yoga, and when did we start twerking? When did we start <laughs> grinding on yoga mats? I want to know, when did Patanjali tell you to, or you know what I mean? Or, or when did my or whoever you believe in, tell you that that was part of the practice? And it also defeats it, because we should be aligned in a certain way for our bodies to open up. So it's like you're not getting the full benefit of the practice if you're grinding on a yoga mat. I don't understand why we do this. Wow. I've never seen that. That is... Oh, I'm going to have to keep an eye out for that uh, when I go to practice tomorrow to see if anybody breaks into spontaneous twerking. But... Um, wow. The, I, I don't want to lose the core aspect, what she said, though, about oh, the importance of course. core, because I was very weak uh, in my core and I'm still building it up. However, uh, after doing yoga daily for three months, I am not weak in my core anymore. And now I go to class. I request core uh, for all of the classes where they say, you know, anything people want to work on. I am the first person to say core. And I had white people become aggressive about this twice and it happened quickly it started happened repeatedly typically if you have a class where someone says requests core or even if core is mentioned a lot of times you'll hear collective groan now taking into account what she just said that's my view and i've heard that repeated consistently that having really strong abs real important to you know strengthening your yoga practice and doing those inversions and headstands and all that stuff you need really strong ab muscles to support it's good for your posture like so many benefits to having strong abs and then you look get to look cool in the summertime all of that Grown. Oh, we don't want to do core. We don't. That's very, very common. My experience yeah. that was very irregular and beyond just the groan the first time it happened. I was talking to my non-white instructor who I love. 
end of class, I'm thanking her and I'm saying, you know, we really didn't do any core. You know, I feel like we kind of cheated out on that. And she was like, I don't really like core. That's why I try to minimize doing it in practice and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, moving <laughs> on. A white, a white, yeah, that's what she said. Anyway, she has super flat abs, so whatever. Uh, a white guy <laughs> who was not even in the class He's coming in for the next class, immediately comes up and says, I hate it when people ask for core in yoga. If you want core, you can just go to the gym. This is not about coming here and doing lots of crunches. I didn't say anything about doing crunches. I just said, you know, we didn't do core. And I'm like, wow, like you weren't even in the class. Like, how did you even? And incident number one, 10 days later, I'm in class. They say any request, let's do core. We don't want to do core. The uh, instructor, white woman, she says, okay, everyone, make sure you send Gus some love when we get to the core part of class. Mm -hmm. We get to the core part, and I'll tell you what we were doing. So, okay, you have your uh, legs above your head. You have your, uh, you're on your back. You have your hands uh, extended, uh, above your head on the floor, right? Above your head and your legs are to the ceiling. You're kind of in an L shape. You get your yoga block and you're just going up and lifting your legs down and just going back and forth doing that. So we do mm -hmm. like one round of that, I think five breaths, I don't know. Uh, and we stop. She's like, we're gonna take a break and then we do one more round. White guy yells out, who are we supposed to thank for doing this? <laughs> Whoa, whoa, whoa. We are in a Sunday morning yoga class. No, yes. It's the Sabbath. Who yells out in a yoga class? I thought they said if you don't want to do it, just don't do it. If you don't want to do this, right. you can do child's pose. They give lots of options. Right. If you I have no, and I still haven't to this day, I have never heard someone yell out in anger at another person about why are we doing this pose or I don't want never and I was just like because of that now every class I ask and I don't just ask for core now that my abs are strong I ab I ask for core and do it with a smile <laughs> like when they gripe about it just because they've been so nasty and racist about it do you think I'm out of line or am I misconstruing thinking that no, these I are think that you're completely aligned like that's what first of all core is important and in yoga you're supposed to be practicing the asanas you dislike the most you're not supposed to be just doing the asanas that you mastered already what's the point you've already done that you know so any and you need core strength continuously and I think that you should always ask for what you need so like that's the students were out of control in that class on a sunday morning a i just sunday. want to emphasize on a sunday morning yeah. yelling I get my way. That's, the problem. that's the problem have you have you had any uh, i was going to ask if you've had any white female specifically but if you've had anyone who has you know questioned or raised issue with why you exclude uh whites from the women of color healing retreats oh yeah um so we didn't have that we well in costa rica people would ask about it things like that but it was pretty 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 chill um, but when the Vice segment aired, I, you know, we still get emails. People were emailing and asking, you know, why aren't white people allowed and all of these things. And I said, well, it's called Women of Color Healing Retreats. <laughs> That's why. Um, but, yeah, people definitely ask about why, what's the reason. Um, and they still inquire on if I've had white women try to attend the retreats, all of those things. So, yeah, people have definitely asked about it. Do you have like a codified response for bam, this is what I say, I've got it perfected? No, I, I go with whatever I'm feeling that day, or I just don't answer. Now I don't answer. So since the Vice segment aired, if someone emails me and they say, because people do things, you know, they do it deliberately. So they'll say, you know, I'm whatever race, can I come to the retreat? I don't answer it because if you go to the website, it says, um, you know, we recognize that the terms black, Negro, African were all given to us by our oppressors. So we do not practice being attached to any of the terms. Women of Color Healing Retreats is a space for black women and for um, women of color who identify as black. So that's it. You know, that's who's coming. That's who's getting in. And there's no question. There's no anything. You know, if someone 
has a question about it, they can go to the FAQ page now. Hmm. Have you had like, I'm just trying to see like the identity or the vetting process, I guess it would be like, do you, are you able to see what the person looks like? Or if you had white people show up and you had to be like, Oh, no, nope, sorry. This is. Oh no. I've had, I've had like straight up emails, even before the, uh, the vice segment, I've had emails where they've asked me, you know, um, you know, I am a white woman and I want to come because my friend is black and we just think that the retreat in general is amazing and we want to experience it together. And I've said, you know, well, you definitely can't come, but your friend can come because this retreat is a safe space. <laughs> because, because this retreat is a safe space for black women um, and for people of color. Because I do work with black men in the surf lessons. I hire black men throughout the retreat. Um, and so I tell them, like, it's a safe space for people of color. So you wouldn't be able to come to this retreat. And also, there are a million retreats for white people. Amen. Why are you Amen. Right? So I'm like, wow, there's a million things. And you're, just, you're upset that you can't get into this one space. You know, they just... It's just this thing with thinking that you're just entitled to everything, even in a black woman's space. Satya X, live from Costa Rica, context of white supremacy. What's your favorite yoga posture? Oh, that's a good question. Mm, Tavasana, <laughs> right now. Oh, that's <laughs> perfect answer. Perfect let's answer. Let me tell you why right now. Um, the reason why it is, is because I used to, when I, during Savasana, I would just, you know, think about what I needed to do next, all of those things. But I stopped doing that and I started to just focus on my third eye and really, really, really being in tune with my breath. And I feel as though it's opened me up a lot. So right now it's my favorite. Wow. That is perfect answer and that is exactly uh what my yoga instructor or one of my yoga instructors said this week uh they were that somehow it came up like what's your favorite posture or what's the the most important posture and he said it's shavasana of course for people who yeah. do not do yoga shavasana is generally what you do at the very end where you just get to lie flat on your mat on your back and just stretch out lay out and be as comfortable as you possibly can and just yeah. breathe and it's the most important. it allows you because after you practice all of those asanas it allows it you know we have um memory so it allows your body to know what it's just done it allows everything to sink in and also shavasana is actually there it's supposed to prepare you for death to allow you to be you know understanding and accepting of it and to have a peaceful death that's what it's supposed to be for too Wow. I did not know that. I did not know mm -hmm. that. Wow. I can give you another quick uh, story from my practice and then we can get some of the callers. Uh, I stopped doing Shavasana. I was thinking of the different ways that I have been impacted uh, by doing yoga with in an environment that is dominated by racists and mm -hmm. how my practice has been shaped by that experience. And I'm very aggressive with my yoga practice. Like the shirt that I wear to every single yoga practice without fail is my shirt. It says, please respect me like I am a white person. I wear that to every single <laughs> yoga <wear> class, <laughs> every single yoga class. I do take my shirt off in class, but at least I start the class so that they can see that I have that on every single yoga <laughs> class. Like one of my favorite moments, I wore that shirt and this white woman, she was working there. She said, uh, you always have the funniest shirts on. Let me see what your shirt says. And she looked and she saw it was that one. And her, her smile totally dropped. She just said, oh. <laughs> and I went to a class. I wear that shirt to every class. But I did not even do Shavasana for a long time uh, in class because I, I would go and see these are white, like I do yoga. Every, in fact, I don't just do class every day. This mm -hmm. week, since Sunday, I have taken nine classes. Uh, last week, I took seven clean, 17 classes. And the week before, oh, I took 17 classes. That's amazing. Um, you must feel good right now. <laughs> I feel amazing. I feel better than I felt in years. And a huge part of that is because of the non-white instructor that I love when I was not doing 17 classes a week. 
I was going to take a restorative class. She thought I was coming to take her class, which was at the same time. She just assumed I was there for that. And I said, I'm not qualified for that. Uh, it says on the website that you have to have been practicing for a year. to take. It's a level two, three class. And she said, oh, I've seen you practice before. I've only, at that time, I'd only been practicing for a month. And she said, well, I've seen you practice before. You can do it. It's no problem. If you, if the same thing I said before, if something comes up that you don't like or can't do, just don't do it. You can take the class. And just her, she had more confidence in what I could do than I did at that time. That had a huge impact. I took her class and I was able to do it. And now I take 17 classes a week, no problem. Anyway, in taking, that many, in taking that many classes, I see all of the same people all of the time. So I would come and see these white people and they would never, like I would see them every day. Like some of these people, I see them five times a week. And as soon as we get outside, they don't speak, nothing. And I'm again, I'm not there to make friends. I'm not confused about any of this, but it has made right. me very aggressive in how my mindset, when I, so I have my shirt on, for a long time, I didn't do Shavasana. Uh, my yoga, the non-white yoga instructor yesterday, she commented, she said, you never open your hands in Shavasana, which is the way most people take it. Most of the mm -hmm. time, I hug myself and I do that. A different non-white instructor, she told us at the end, she said, if you want to take it with your hands up, that's fine. If you need more love and self-care, give yourself a hug. Mm -hmm. That resonated. I have been doing it. And because I'm frequently doing yoga with people that I regard as racists, since I'm not doing yoga with friends, I will keep my energy to myself. And so that's like I, it just it has had a huge impact on I don't even do child's pose uh, most of the time with the class. Like I just work and stay focused on other things. But it, I think I would have a very different practice if I was only practicing with black people, non-white people. I think yeah, I think very, so. I think for me too, because I, I go, you know, in my retreats, it's all black everything. But what in my everyday life in the Costa Rica, well, right now I'm actually going to the studio here. All of the classes are just all Costa Rican people, which are a lot of brown people. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. So I'm having a great time in the classes here. But before, it would be all white people. So I felt the same way. I would just go put my yoga mat down, practice, and like, Juiced out and like head out of class. <laughs> <laughs> like class. Everybody would be standing around talking. You know, you have to pass the water bottle to clean the mat. I get my water bottle and I gotta go. <laughs> yep. 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 That is exactly how I function and people you know had commented about it and everything, but it's just saying this is Seattle. I can't even emphasize it's not like I am in super white yeah. Seattle where almost every class I am the only black person uh, and a black male at that uh, I mean yeah <laughs> but you know what? that's actually good the way that we have done it because at the end of the day yoga is about you it's not about anybody else just as in a way where yoga is not a sport it's not a competition it's not a fitness class it is your own practice where you are healing yourself and connecting with yourself. So you have the right to go into a class and say, I'm just going to focus on my practice and leave. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. You know what I mean? They try to make it seem as though you have to be part of like their white yoga community. And no, you don't have to because the practice is really about you. It's a personal practice. Absolutely. I agree completely. I see some of the folks that had a, a hand up uh, red in Nevada, who I mentioned previously. I hope I didn't uh, steal your question. If you were going to comment on that red in Nevada, did you have a question for Satya? You should be with us. Oh, thank you for taking my call. And hello, Ms. Satya. And um, actually, I was going to just briefly say something about that. Um, just more details. And it's, it actually... Um, scared me away from doing yoga for years but it was I was at a yoga um, class and it was for a gym in in Las Vegas I live in Nevada and the white instructors mainly white females or people who might classify themselves as white who maybe speak Spanish and she was mm -hmm. like you know sit on your feet and I didn't that was my first yoga class and I made sure to go into one of the beginner ones and she 
just kept saying it and kept saying it. And, and I, I, I felt like I wasn't really all that flexible and I wasn't as small as everybody else in the class. And I actually did basically the same thing that you did. So like when I felt that the time was right, I put the mat away and I left and then I didn't, you know, do anything like that for five, like for five plus years. And then I started to, um, I decided one day to Google like black females doing yoga and that's what kind of helped me because I'm like, if my body is different than theirs and they don't really care, she didn't try to help me or anything. She just kept kind of like just barking the order. And so that's, that's, that was a little bit uh, more um, about my story. Um, but uh, the question that I did have was actually you, you all kind of covered everything. Um, what kind of led you to the, your belief or your feeling as far as um, gender not really being a uh something uh, like a, a, a thing, thing I think that's what you might have said yes a concept well, yes. And, um, we, most of the things that we are living today are social constructs you know gender isn't real um, we've been taught you know this is what a man is and this is what a man does this is what a woman is and this is what a woman does but it's not you know we have we have we can say we have feminine and masculine energies but it's not real. And so now that we have gender, now we're assigned gender roles. And so now it becomes, you are assigned this gender role as a woman. Now it becomes, this is the way that you are supposed to live. But none of it is real. We are just beings. We're not, we're honestly, at the end of the day, we're not even black. You know, white people gave us that name. We, we, don't, we don't have a term for ourselves because they literally came in and interrupted our beautiful history and, you know, renamed us and told us how we were going to navigate the world. And so I like to always talk about unlearning, you know, all the way down to as far as we can get in history and uh, to see what we created and what we started. But that's what, do you understand what I mean? Oh, yes, I, I definitely understand. Um, then I guess the, the only other question um, that I had, I understand that you said, um, you know, that you do have basically all black everything, but then white people are still kind of still uh, coming in and still basically doing what they typically do, colonize. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any like fears, maybe like within the, the near future, maybe five or 10 years that they will, you know, as they did in New York, um, come and maybe, uh, try to buy up the land that you are currently on. And um, that'll be my last question. I'll meet my line. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have any fear around it at all because I will not sell. You know, I really follow the teachings of uh, Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X and so many other black revolutionaries. And I think that, you know, we've had prophets tell us time and time again of what we need to do. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us that we needed to leave the United States, go outside of the country, acquire land, start our own nation. And so I really respect those beliefs. I really believe in those teachings. I really believe in creating a black nation. So I will not sell to a white person. Uh, like I will not do business with white people. Context of white supremacy. Thank you, Red in Nevada. Uh, retired firefighter in Florida. Did you have a question for Satya X? You should be with us, sir. Greetings, everyone. Uh, just about all of the questions that I had uh, through the uh, thorough interview uh, was uh, was answered. And uh, I would say uh, to the affirmative uh, and positive in the answering uh, I just would like to uh, commend the uh, the guests to the highest level <laughs> uh, uh, about what she's doing. Uh, I think uh, uh, the ladies that uh, she uh, uh, deals with uh, is something that is very much deserving. Uh, I do kind of wish I was like a... Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use a metaphor, uh, uh, Gus, uh, a, a crow on a fence just to be able to uh, observe all of this uh, this uh, intelligence and beauty that's uh, doing that uh, type of uh, uh, spiritual uh, work. Uh, and uh, I also uh, appreciate to the highest uh, her analysis uh, of the Caribbean uh, because oftentimes, uh, 
you have non-white people that uh, I come in contact with in this part of the world, and they have more of a, uh, I would say, a uh, incorrect uh, 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 analysis of the Caribbean uh, as far as that concerned. And they're more or less uh, bragging. Uh, and and in my opinion, using anti-blackness in their bragging about uh, mm-hmm. uh, the position in those areas, and uh, I really appreciate uh, someone who who really uh, was bold enough to just drop the things that she was that she was involved in because it's incorrect for her, and go somewhere else that she thought was better for her. And uh, I mean that that's like that's like the ultimate of. Uh, of uh, uh, of uh, self confidence, and uh, just like to you know commend her for for that, and uh, uh, it also if it, 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 it's also between yourself and the guests, it's, it's getting me more and more interested into uh, doing some research on and, and getting involved with yoga. It's probably I, I think is a yoga class maybe down at this center in, in uh, a few miles from where I stay at. I'm a uh, go and examine and see if it is such. Uh, mm-hmm. And y'all really are helping me thinking about that instead of just uh, lifting rates and running. Uh, you, uh, uh, thank you for the program. You're in Miami. It's yoga studios all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could easily find like 10, well, 15. Well, if, 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 if the people in charge are, is there, if, if the people in charge are like your guests, that would be the question you know with me. I actually, my, my, my main, one of my main yoga teachers, black woman, her name is Kayla Butler. She teaches, she's in Florida, based in Florida, and she teaches yoga to black people in Florida. I'm going to somehow, if I could get your contact, put her in contact with you, and she would provide you yoga classes. She's a black woman. She's excellent. She gives teachings to um, black men all the time. And also... There is a black man that creates retreats for black people, and I can give you his contact info as well. And I want to say thank you for what you said, because um, there's a lot of people that I don't want to say aren't conscious, but just aren't aware of how conditioned we are. And so I really appreciate platforms like the cows and uh, people like you that understand where I'm coming from and that are aligned with what blackness means. So I really appreciate what you said, too. For sure. I will. Yes, ma'am facilitate uh passing the information if uh, you want to email it to me i can shoot it to him or yeah, whatever uh definitely but i can just say quickly uh as again i came to yoga because i was a runner uh, that's why i came to yoga and yoga just the benefits are am- like she gave a ton of great practical benefits uh i can say even just one balance my one of my non-white yoga instructors she just said last month she said uh when we do all these wacky poses where you're balancing on one foot and all this stuff uh you know this is there is a practical benefit uh the sidewalk is not even uh you might if you're fortunate live to become older uh where balance becomes a problem if you can strengthen these muscles that can be a big benefit just practically in life Weeks later, I'm going to yoga class in Seattle. Guess what? It rained. There's a slick spot on the sidewalk. My foot slid, but I had two feet on the ground and immediately caught myself. I said, oh, man, I'm pretty good at balancing (laughs) on one foot. If I have two feet on the ground, I'm going to be on my square. It's going to take a lot to knock me off balance if I can get two feet on the ground and that I think is a huge benefit. Just just being grounded. I that was something yeah. I forgot in when you practice daily and yeah. particularly when you get good at balance, like you when you have two feet on the ground, you become so grounded. It's a very it's just a very different feeling. Like your posture because that's another total benefit. Your posture improves yeah, the drastically. Is oh yeah. core helps a lot with that too. Your core is so strong. When your your sitting posture improves drastically, your standing posture improves drastically. I mean it's huge practical yeah. benefits uh for yoga. Uh core strength helps with uh, a lot of that too, but just 
balance, uh, being yeah. more balanced. And they say that yoga is really good for, um, I'm sorry, they say that it's good to pair it with weightlifting, too. Mm. <coughs> Keeps pair, you from being all tight. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Tons of benefits to pair yoga with any other physical activity uh, that you're doing. Uh, some of the I did crow. He mentioned crow. I did crow's pose today. I think like three times we did that. Uh, the person that called in Thomas in New York. Did you have a question for Satya X Thomas in New York? Yes. Good evening, guys. Good evening, Satya. My quick question was, um, are you familiar with Nature Boy? I know that um, there was a person, YouTube personality named Nature Boy who moved a whole bunch of people to Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to know if you were familiar with him, and that was my only question. Thank you. Yeah, Nature Girl Mocha is one of my greatest friends. We were roommates in Costa Rica. So, yeah, I'm familiar with them. Okay, right on. Appreciate that, Thomas, in New York. Uh, Ivy, if you had a question for Satya X, you should be with us. Yes, uh, greetings, Gus. And uh, is it Satya? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Satya. You said Satya? Yeah, it's one of the yamas of yoga. It means truthfulness. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, Greetings and greetings to everyone on the line. Thank you for coming on the program. I found your... um, commentary just uh extremely um informative i had two questions if if i can ask them um the first one was um can you tell me how um i I think you said and forgive me if i'm if i'm not saying it right what you said that that the racism in costa rica is i believe you said different and less than it is uh in the states and so i was uh wanting to know how, like, what, what the difference is? How is it different? How is it less? Like, maybe an example or two. Um, that, that was my first question. Well, I'm saying that it's less, and as I'm saying it from a black person from the United States. I think that if I was saying it from a perspective from a black person that was born and raised here, they might say it's the same way. So I have to put that out there. Um, yeah, so I don't really want to speak too much for the black experience here, for the people born and raised here, because I think that if I was born and raised in Costa Rica as a black person, I would be over the top pissed because you have the black people that were born here, then you have the white Costa Rican people, and then you have the white American and European people. So it's it's heavy, um, but I say that it's different because I'm looking at it from my experience of being from a different country. And so I feel as though, you know, the United States is, you know, just top racist. But from someone living here, they might have a different feeling about it. Well, I'm actually, um, you know, from the States as well. Could you tell me, like, how, I guess, you personally have experienced it differently? In Costa Rica? Well, I feel like I experience it differently because I don't have to be around it as much. Well, also because I don't really have any white people in my life at all. Um, So I guess that's why I experience racism different. I really feel like I experience it more in a systemic way instead of a personal way. I think that, you know, a lot of black people complain about white people and racism and all of these things, but then they are best friends with white people or they're constantly having conversations with them, trying to teach them how to not be racist. And that's not where I'm at. So I feel as though I have this different um, experience of racism with where I'm at in my life, because my way of combating racism is to eliminate white people from out of my personal life. Okay, thank you for that. That was um, very helpful and is, and is exactly what I was um, trying to understand. And oh, my only other question was, um, I know that, if I'm not mistaken, white people tried to bring a case against uh, the directors and a lot of the the people uh, from the Black Panther movie because they were saying it was only one white person in it or two or whatever. <laughs> um, and we know that we know that white people are, you know, invaders. Just even as you were talking about in the Caribbean, um, mm-hmm. do you know how you can? I guess are are you are you concerned with? you know, them coming in and maybe trying to sue or something like that, trying to, you know, so that they can invade or how you can, I guess, protect against that? 
they they've tried. I mean, they've attempted because it's a black space. So white people cannot take women of color healing retreats. They can't take my commentary. They can't deal with me. They've attempted, but I feel as though I am just so connected with and with our ancestors and with spirit. I feel so protected walking in this earth that you know they could come at me with paperwork with anything that they want, and we're gonna come out all right. You know, I just think that the problem is when we look to them for validation or when we kind of fold and then we go to them. That's when we mess up. But I really believe if you keep it black, you're going to be okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Now I need my line. Thanks, Gus. Take care, everybody. Appreciate that, Ivy. Uh, M. Handisi. M. Handisi, did you have a question for Satya X? Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, greetings. Um, and greetings to you, Miss Satia. Hi. Uh, I had a question as to, well, I had a, a, a few short questions. The first question was, the people there, the black people, do they identify themselves as indigenous to that area? Oh, that's a great question. And or do they, do they, do they, do they so... There's like three ways I think they can identify themselves. Do they identify themselves as indigenous from that area only? Do they identify themselves as African only? Or do they identify themselves as both? So in Costa Rica, they have the Bribri tribe. And they say that those are the indigenous people of the country, the Bribri people. And they are basically native people. And that's who people, you know, say that they're indigenous. Now, the black people here... They say that they came from um, Jamaica through the banana plantation and through slavery, and that's how they got here. So a lot of black people here, they identify as African. They're very, very, very much deeply into their roots. It's very beautiful. But then you also have, uh, at the same time, the same people don't align with being black. You know, it's very much one love, um, they see white people as their saviors. Like I was dating someone, a black person here, and he basically broke it down to me that they look at white people as their saviors because white people have come in and given them crumbs. But because it's a third world country, they there's nowhere else to look to. So they look at them as if they're saviors. So it's very, very complicated, the race here. Okay. And that's why for me, it's just very important. Say- Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. I was saying, like, that's why for me, it was super, it's just super important to, like, work with the black, because I work with the black people from Costa Rica as well, and so it's very important for me to come in and to give them jobs, to have them see a black person come in and to give them jobs, instead of them constantly having to beg for scraps from white Americans and Europeans so that they can have, like, lose this mindset that white people are hurting them, but are also their saviors, so that they can see the reality of the situation. That's good. Now, the individuals that come from Jamaica, do they consider themselves indigenous to the Americas, the North and Central South America? Do they consider themselves indigenous to the Americas? Or do they say, we only, we just came here from um, Africa? They say they just came from Africa. That's it. They okay. feel like they basically then, don't even feel alive to America at all. You said they basically, they feel like they basically. They they kind of don't feel like they have anything to do with like the Americas at all. But I mean, ultimately, yeah. we know the whole world is Africa, no matter where we go. If we're in Costa Rica, if we're in Mexico, we're in Africa. Because maps and continents, none of this shit is real. I'm sorry to curse, but none of it is real. And now, um, now, within the construction or the social constructs of the Americas and Africa, mm-hmm. now, what is the likelihood that the black people in the Caribbeans will ally with the rest of the black Americans? Mm, it's, it's small. You know, Pan-Africanism is... It's a beautiful concept, and I'm all about it, but it's very, very small. Um, we've been divided in a lot of different ways. Like, people have done a lot of damage 
um, by traveling to these countries and just implementing false beliefs about black Americans or about black people in general. So it's very, very low, low chance. Yes, those were my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Caller who dialed in last four digits nine zero six three nine zero six three. Did you have a question for Satya? Did you have a question? Hi, um, this is technically speaking. Can I be heard? Oh, greetings. I call in Wisconsin. Um, actually, I'm in Wisconsin. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, I'm sorry. I got the voice confused. My apologies, ma'am. I'm sorry. Technically speaking, go ahead with your question. Um, I actually had a statement or a comment about my experience with a retreat like this and wanted to get feedback or thoughts from the guests, if that's okay, or anyone else. Uh, sure, let's hear it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, to the guests and to you guys for having the show and being here. Um, I first wanted to say to the guests that I'm just so glad that you, you're you so bold in your stance about blackness and having a space where blackness can be sacred and safe. And um, so I really appreciate that. And it just reminds me of a post that I just made um, from a quote that our queen mother, Winnie Mandela, said, and she said, um, one of her quotes is, I'm not sorry. I will never be sorry. I would do everything I did again if I had to, everything. So it really reminds me of that same type of spirit, which I really appreciate. Um, So when, when I heard that this broadcast was going on, like, my spirit really leaped because of the experiences I recently had about a year ago with going to retreats that were for black women. And I didn't really know it was for black women. I had never been to a retreat and I wasn't really that excited about going, except that I had been experiencing what I call um, undiagnosed illness, um, like really, really extreme fatigue. So um, I went to the retreat and what I got from it was so life-changing, so healing, that I was just in shock, and it kind of changed my whole paradigm of how I saw things, because um, I am a person who really loves Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. One thing that I love about her patient teaching is she would always say that um, Black self-respect is more powerful than any weapon, I'm paraphrasing, she would say a certain weapon, a bomb, or whatnot. And just that simple statement, I started to see as a real solution because I started to see that as self-respect from the standpoint of just respecting my blackness enough to feed myself properly, to engage in self-care, and to um, extend that same love for myself to my other sisters and brothers, how that statement had so much from the standpoint of just on the surface, just beneath the surface and deep under the surface. Because when I got around these other sisters, I felt that just kind of like you mentioned about yoga, like there was some type of ancient wisdom or frequency or something more that was coming from just being around this. And I feel like as, I, as, as I've been learning and growing and recognizing, coming to terms with what we can know about racism, white supremacy, it, it, I'm just really sensitive to like the deliberate disrespect that is a, a constant. It's just like a something that these people are driven to do. And so the energy, the frequency of just being in their presence has, I'm observing myself, is it, it's been very, very toxic. And so I feel like the radical individualism that kept me feeling like maybe, you know, why would I need to go to a, det- a retreat with a lot of other black women or even be around a lot of other black women in some type of healing way? I think that's something that keeps us in our own self-made solitary confinement. So, um, you know, it's the results I got from this what what it was really amazing. It's like somebody being starved for oxygen and then getting like full doses of oxygen. 
Um, and so, you know, it's led me to even start some little retreat type things on my own. And so I just wanted to share that experience, see if you had any comments or anyone else had any comments about this, because I think that, um, you know, as our elder mentioned about self-respect, I think this is a major form of self-respect that can lead to big things um, for us, big uh, ways of solving our problems and healing. And I see this seeming to be a frequency that's going out all over the globe. Mm-hmm. And that's all I have to say. Thank you all for listening. I guess, did you have uh, a comment, uh, Satya? Did you have a comment? or? Yeah, what you said is very true. I think that retreats, generally speaking, are really, really transformative because you do get, whether it's a four-day, seven-day, ten-day retreat this time, if it's a black retreat, to be within your own community, to unpack and to be with people that mirror you. So it is a transformative thing. Um, I agree with what she said pretty much. So, yeah. I'm so glad you had that experience, uh, technically speaking. My apologies again for uh, mixing you up with our, our caller in Wisconsin. I am a victim. Thank you for being patient. Uh, but I'm so glad you had that experience. And I think because of white supremacy, there's been so much anti-blackness and, and that conditioning i think uh satya she said that that we've been conditioned part of our victimization uh we have been trained coordinated to be in conflict with each other and so when you can be in an environment where it's constructive and it's not combative and we're not you know here to, mm-hmm. to argue and name call and all that like we're here doing something constructive and supporting one another and being patient and listening <laughs> and you know you feel safe where you can talk and you know discuss issues like oh man like i think a lot of just basic companionship the basic humanity that i think white supremacy unfortunately does an exceptional job extinguishing I think a lot of that goes to why Satya founded Women of Color Healing Retreats. Go to the website, womenofcolorhealingretreats.com. Uh, the person yeah. who dialed and in. And it's just really important for us to just continue to unlearn all of these things that they've tried to, you know, instill in us because none of it is true. You know, they have taught us that, like, they need to be in our presence for us to do anything. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, it's these 15 to 20 black women. Does anybody argue what happens? And that's the the people expect that. But we come together and it is so peaceful. We cook together. It's such a community environment and there's no classism. You know, it can be someone that is from the hood, somebody that's from the suburbs. It does not matter where you're from. We're going to come together and we're going to talk about it and we're going to work this shit out because classism is really, really was going to it's really, really breaking the black community. Black people thinking that they're better than other black people is a huge problem. And so um, basically just to unlearn all of these things allows us to heal ourselves. But more importantly, it allows us to heal the youth because that's the priority is the youth. That's who needs to be, you know, who we need to be thinking about. Amen. Person uh, who dialed in last four digits, six, nine, four, six, six, nine, four, six. Did you have a question for Satya? You should be with us. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is a caller from Wisconsin. Um, I just wanted to say briefly thank you very much, Satya, for being on the program. It's been highly informative, highly educational, and very inspiring. Um, I did have a question. I had been, I'm a big fan of meditation, and Mm -hmm. so I was interested in, um, in yoga, but the presence of white females has really put me off uh, Mm -hmm. from being, from going to yoga classes. Um, So my, um, I guess yoga looks a bit, maybe, for lack of a better term, dangerous to try on your own, but Mm -hmm. do you think there are some ways a beginner could try maybe learning on their own? Yeah, there's definitely ways. Um, There's some black women that are yoga teachers that have put out videos where you can practice in your home because I have the same issue. I can come up with those same issues as well where I'm like, you know what, this week I don't want to see a white person. And so I'll have to practice in my house um, by myself. So if you can somehow get 
the like we can do an email exchange. I can get that out to you, or I can give you um, women that are doing both comedic yoga, hatha yoga, all kinds of yoga that have put out DVDs that are selling it. One of my teachers, her name is Ona Hawk. She's all about practicing African yoga. Um, you can do classes with her right in your home. You don't have to worry about white people at all because I definitely understand that part of um, not wanting to go to class. And just this don't- is so unfortunate. Absolutely. I was just going to add quickly. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to add in terms of uh, being a beginner. When I started originally, I started uh, practicing by myself. And I, I mean, unless you're talking like inversions, I think the vast majority of poses you could pretty safely do uh, by yourself. Oh, and, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 100 percent yeah, I don't think I don't think it's enough to be intimidated by. I think most of the the beginner poses, I think you might tip over, but I don't think it would be any serious injury, and it wouldn't even be embarrassing because you'll be by yourself. Like, uh, yeah, I think you'll be. And you, join join our mailing list because what we're trying to do 2018 this summer and starting all of next year, we're trying to go around in the United States to provide yoga classes, you know, to studios that will donate so we can give free yoga classes to only black people. So join our mailing list so that we can see, like, what cities that we can go to where people are actually asking for yoga classes. Because we want to bring it to the United States as well, where we're going to have, like, all black yoga classes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, and I just, just wanted to piggyback off of technically speaking. Um, I hold a, no. Um, so a group I belong to holds a women's retreat every year, and it is quite refreshing just to get um, away and, and, and actually uh, take part in some sort of healing practice. We usually do meditation retreats. Um, it's really refreshing, to, and mostly women of color. There have been some infiltrators, but uh, mostly <laughs> women of color um, who have come and, and really renewed themselves spiritually. So... I, I definitely am checking out your website now and, and looking at the dates and everything. And, and I think this is an awesome, awesome thing that you have. And I, I'm, again, greatly inspired. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, retreats, a lot of people don't, like, don't realize, like, retreats really, 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 really will transform you or really will reset you because you're being taken out of this environment that's constantly constantly taking a toll on you and being set in an environment that's there to just heal you. So retreats will do it for you. Absolutely. Context of white supremacy. A uh, couple other quick questions I wanted to get in. Uh, we didn't want to take up your whole evening. Uh, if you're listening and you have a question uh, for Satya, uh, you should go ahead and get your hand up. Uh, do not lollygag and wait till the last uh, moment if you think there's something that you want to ask. Uh, I, I guess one question, uh, when you are practicing or instructing, lights on, lights off? On, on, on for sure. Unless it's like, I think that you can do restorative with the lights dim, but I think lights should be on for sure. And that I think one of the biggest things is don't look at other people while you're practicing and don't compare yourself. If someone can do something better than you, that's great because that's where they're at in their practice. But point being, always focus on your own practice. It doesn't matter what other people can do in the class because you're not, it's not a sport. You're not competing with the person beside you. It's about where you are at. But always, I like lights on unless it's something more restorative and relaxing, then it would be more of dim lights with like candles. Okay. Okay. I was able to take a lot of vinyasa classes where they did uh, no lights. In Seattle, it's very dark in the wintertime. And so they would do uh, the morning classes when the sun is not up, no lights. And then pretty much by 430, if you don't turn the lights on, it's going to be dark. They would not turn the lights on. And it uh, was a little weird at first, but it accomplished mm -hmm. the same thing that you were just talking about where it, because it's dark, it makes it difficult to see the other people. So you end up focusing mm -hmm. more on yourself just because, you know, oh, you can't yeah. really see them. And yeah, it's, it's a little odd at first, but yeah, I'm a big fan of no lights or natural lights for yoga. Uh, yeah. do, do non black, non white females come to the retreat? Non-black, non-white. You mean people that identify as like Latin and all, and then um, Indian and right. That's what you mean. Those, those people are still African at the core, you know. But um, no, they don't come into the retreat. 
uh, they would have to identify as you have to be a black person in this retreat. That's this is one space to get into. You need to be a black woman to get into the kids program. You need to be a kids a, a child of color. Anything that I create will only be for black people. That's how we're doing it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> right on. Uh, the I wanted to ask as well when you gave your your commentary about uh, gender being a construct, uh, and you just mm-hmm. say I'm a I'm a black person. Uh, mm-hmm. It does seem incongruent because it's women of color healing retreat, women yeah. being the first word. Why? I mean, it's not yeah. person of color. No, because I do want to. I have to speak to a certain audience. And most people do identify as women or don't know about gender not being a social construct. So I do want to speak to a certain audience. Um, So I deliberately say, you know, it's for women of color. But I don't see uh, gender is just like a whole game to control us, to tell us how we're supposed to navigate the system, how we're supposed to work things. But I need to speak to a certain audience. And so I speak to uh, women of color or black women. And I do want to eventually be able to hold space for black men, but I think it should be a black man, uh, a person that identifies as a black man. Because I feel like that's a very important thing as someone to come in and to have a healing space for black men as well. Hmm. Be nice to get down to Costa Rica to do some yoga. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do patrons have difficulty with the vegan diet? and fasting from alcohol and smoking uh, and while they're participating in the retreat? They don't have, well, they know because when you sign up for the retreat, it's all on the website, you know, it's a vegan retreat. So they know what they're signing up for. But we give like stellar, excellent, excellent, excellent meals. Um, I put everything. So I really, really customize this retreat. It's not one of those retreats where, You get in and there's just a cafeteria. No, I sit down with the kitchen team, all black kitchen team. I sit down with them. We break down each food, you know, how it's going to be helpful for the morning. If we have yoga at a certain point, what meal would work for them if they're going to have the class two hours later? All of the food is organic. So when the women come in, they know that their bodies are about to be nurtured. And so a lot of people smoke on a daily basis. Uh, cigarettes or they drink alcohol or they're eating meat and so knowing that you're going to be in this set controlled environment to just heal and just detox from that stuff it kind of allows them to come in with a certain mindset ready to be open for things and I also tell them you know after they register I send out emails you know telling them prepare your body try to go vegetarian for about two or three days before you get here I send them tips on veganism things like that so it's not really a problem. Um, and with the drinking, we don't go partying throughout the retreat. Our gates close at 8 p.m. And so after 8 p.m., we have like a quiet hour where people just are able to read or journal. Um, nobody's really talking. The phones are turned off and you just sit with yourself. So there's no partying or anything like that. But people, black people, we want that. And, you know, but we're taught that we just want to party and do all of those things. But we want environments like this but because of how white society portrays us we believe that we don't want these things wow context of white supremacy uh satya x joining us live from costa rica are there any resources that you would recommend for any of our listeners black people who might be interested in yoga, like things that you would say, hey, these are some of the materials that I would recommend that you check out besides your website, womenofcolorhealingretreats.com. Literature, it could be like books, videos, websites, anything that you would recommend and material that would also help them decolonize the practice of yoga as they're learning or, you know, just seeking out their curiosity. I would say definitely if you really want to get more deeper into the practice to read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, um, because that book, it can, if, you, if you need a guide with yoga, it's going to give it to you and get a version that's by a person of color because there's a lot of white people out here writing their own versions of the Yoga Sutras, so make sure it's by a person of color. 
um, and read that book. And it's going to definitely guide you. The book changed my entire life. And learn about the yamas and the niyamas. The yamas and niyamas are the spiritual practices of yoga. Um, and they basically tell you um, what you're learning on the yoga mat is exactly what's happening off the yoga mat. Um, and so I'll always learn about the yamas and the niyamas and learn about the yoga sutras. Great information. I'm going to do some homework myself. Uh, do any of our listeners uh, have a, a final question they want to get in uh, before we wrap things up? Final question. Any of the folks that dialed in had a hand up? Everybody? Oh, I have one. I'm sorry. Oh, if you had, we will go ahead, ma'am. We'll check on the listeners okay. in a second. So if you feel, because some people, you know, don't want to practice yoga because of the questioning of it being an Indian practice, even though Indian people are African, therefore it's an African practice, you can also just practice comedic yoga. Um, and so if you want to practice comedic yoga, there's a woman, her name is Ona Hawk. She's actually on my website. You can go to her website. She has DVDs. Her information is amazing. She has created an entire chakra system that aligns with like African practices, and it's just amazing. Um, so check her out, Ona Hawk. Her it's just uh, comedic yoga, and it's African yoga. She'll be at my next retreat, but it's completely, completely sold out. But check her website out. And how many retreats do you offer? I had a per question. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, how many retreats do you do you offer uh, per year, Satya? This year, it's going to be six retreats. It changes every single year. I change the amount of retreats because I want to do more kids programs in the States. So if I am able to do, if we have the funds to do the kids program, then I won't do retreats. And we'll go to the United States and give, you know, free yoga to the kids out there. Wow. Red in Nevada, did you have a question? Yes, and I'll make this as quick as possible. Um, just one quick question. Uh, how are you dealing with, I guess, the, the anti-blackness there? I know that there was a question asked um, about, you know, people not really, um, or black people or people who identify as maybe black, not really um, being, I guess, maybe pan-Africanist, um, which, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess I definitely understand because it's not, it's not necessarily the black people's fault. But um, is how, how are you um, basically dealing with that? Does, I'm assuming yoga does help if you do encounter that. But um, that's the only does, other question I had. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It does help. Um, I deal with it. But I have um, a few black people in my life that are from Costa Rica, born and raised here, that I keep close to me. Anywhere that I go, any country that I go, I make sure that I find black people. And I keep them close to me. And I tell them, we have to stick together. I don't care what you know. I don't care. If you have this white mindset, you're going to have to, we're going to have to do this. So um, in that way, that's how I kind of deal with it. And in the other way, it's always yoga. Yoga brings me back to myself. It brings me back to just disregarding anything about white people. And that's how I really live my life. I don't really focus on white people too much. I kind of just act as, I don't know, I kind of just navigate the world where their thoughts don't even matter because they ultimately don't, you know? That answer your question, Red. Uh, any other folks have a question that they wanted to get in? I have a question. Uh, Ivy, go ahead. Yes. Um, do you uh, are there any particular people uh, on the internet that you recommend that does videos uh, teaching yoga, or just you know any most I guess persons of color will do just a random search or. Um, I would say spread love. Her name is Kayla Bell. I want to make a list for everyone um, of black yoga teachers, but I would say her name is spread love. Her name is uh, Kayla Butler. She is a black woman and she does uh, uh, teachings in Miami, Florida, and she does videos on her Instagram page and on the internet. But I think that I'm going to make this list. I'm going to make a list of just black people that are making videos for everyone to um 
just have access to it. I'm going to put it up on the blog and I'm going to put up different types of yoga because people think that yoga isn't for them, but it could be the kind of yoga you're practicing. So some people may not want to do a crazy fast flow and you can just do something more restorative because it's all still yoga. So I'm going to have different teachers that do different classes so that people can still can find a yoga that feels good for them. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. We can do one more. Anybody have a final question they wanted to get in? Be satisfied, everybody's curiosity. Grand, assume everybody is uh, taking care of the website. Again, women of color healing retreats.com. And you can keep up with us on Instagram. That's the best way. You'll see all of their social media linked, the blog, the free kids of color program, which sounds amazing. I hope uh, people support so that they can do more of the program. You should definitely take advantage uh, in the New York area. I guess last thing uh, or, or a final thought. It was, I think, a, a few days ago I was in class. Once again, the only black person present. And the instructor went around and he asked everyone just to give their name and how long you've been practicing. And I said three months and everybody else went around and some people said, you know, I've been practicing my whole life. Uh, and, you know, these were not like children <laughs> saying this. Uh, and some people said, oh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I, I think everybody in the class had been, pra I think the, the average was about six plus years uh, was mm -hmm. the average. Uh, and I just said, wow, that's, I mean, to have, I mean, that's a substantial amount of practice. Like I cannot imagine the benefits that your body gets being able to do yoga routinely for six years or for your entire life. And then I thought about like what you were talking about in terms of things that black people are encouraged because of white supremacy to be interested in. Uh, we're, you know, party, party and have a good time, that sort of thing and bad food and all that other stuff. Also physical activity we're encouraged football, something that's going to totally destroy yeah. your body and kill you and give you brain damage uh, and basketball, which I mean, I guess it's not as bad as football, but I can't think of a ton of, you know, great benefits that you're going to get from playing a lot of basketball and you can't play basketball for life. Like, I don't know too many 70 year olds who are doing slam dunks and shooting three pointers. You can do yoga for your entire time on the planet and it will have amazing benefits for you. Uh, just uh, if you had a, a final thought on that, just uh, I, I thought that was significant in terms of not it's certainly not saying every white person does yoga because that's not the case. But I definitely see them having greater access and for a longer period than a lot of black people that I've had contact with. I think yoga, there's a lot of racism around it because there's, it's a secret, you know. I think that white people want to dominate the practice because of how healing it is for us. You know, with yoga, we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And so the sympathetic nervous system is flight or fight. And basically, um, it activates stress. So from police brutality, from seeing our brothers and sisters being murdered on social media, from things that we deal with in our everyday life, from dealing with systemic racism, your sympathetic nervous system is constantly, constantly being activated. And so with yoga, it actually activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which allows you to um, de-stress and to relax. So it allows you to heal and I think that that's why there's so much racism around yoga that's underlining where white people do not want this secret to get out. Because if black people practice yoga, I, I don't even know what would happen. You know, we would be able to heal ourselves, future generations. It would just be an entire different conversation. So um, I think that that's why there's just a lot of... Um, hidden things about yoga and also with the amount of practice the reason why I never like to talk about that with people is because there are people that have practiced for 20 years white people of course that have practiced for 20 years and do not know what they are talking about and I have met people that have practiced for two months and know everything that they need to, that that they are saying so the amount of years never really really matters you know it's about what the what the person has learned about um, within their practice but definitely with yoga, 
it can heal you. And it's not just something that people are saying because it's fun. It's because you're really working with your nervous system. And like you said, you know, basketball, all of these things, they're going to wear your body out. Yoga is going to heal your body from things that you thought wasn't going to um, be able to heal. Like, it literally allowed me to learn how to walk again. My yoga teacher, Kayla, she had... um, what did she pull? She pulled something and it completely, completely um, allowed her to heal it. I know so many black yogis that were injured and yoga allowed them to heal from it. It's it's really serious. And I think that's why white people want to represent it so bad because of how beautiful the practice is. That they only want to show themselves doing it. They don't want to show us doing it. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> I completely agree. And uh, I guess the only thing I would add, uh, the inversions, when I say inversions, that just means like when you're doing like headstands, handstands, that sort of thing, upside down. Um, some of them are you don't have to be that challenging, but uh, they say one of the reasons that you do those is to change your perspective and even that growth process. I know I talked about that on the program as well when I was able to do uh, my first uh, forearm stand, uh, the process to be able to build, to be able to do that and the the work and, and even the effort, the practice, as they call it, that uh, where you can see the development to be able to do that, to be able to see yourself where something that you thought you could not do that then you can do that can have a huge impact, uh, particularly things that you think are difficult or that your body can't do with all of the the white supremacy programming that we get, that there's something wrong with us, something wrong with our body and our complexion and all of that, to be able to see yourself do things and to see your body do things that you couldn't do. I think that has a huge impact on your mind that definitely travels off of the mat. Um, I wasn't flexible before I practiced. I wasn't flexible at all. I was so disconnected from my physical body. I had no idea that I was trashing my body, that I was eating all the wrong food, and that I was basically participating in killing myself. And then yoga allowed me to look at my body completely different and to love it. Um, and so that that's definitely true. They don't want to see us like bump up our self esteem. No, because what would that do? You know. Absolutely. Black self-esteem, black. I think both of those would rise dramatically. I think most mm-hmm. of the most of the people that I know that do yoga on a regular basis, they come to have a re. Or I'll put it this way: the vast majority of people that I know who do yoga on a regular basis, unfortunately, most of them are classified as white. Doing yoga on a regular basis, you will have a higher body appreciation than you did before, and probably an over overall higher level of self-esteem and confidence than you did before. Uh, I think it's uh, just uh, easily the major, major pattern that I've seen. And I think to see a whole lot of black people with that, and again, something you could do your entire life. This is not something when you're 55 up, can't, you know, play basketball anymore up, can't play football. No, you could still be doing yoga, 55, 65, Mm -hmm. still be doing your practice and getting all of those great spiritual mental benefits. I can totally understand why whites would want to colonize, dominate, and uh, keep it away from black people. Uh, It's totally womenofcolorhealingretreats.com. Go be very curious, read the information, the blog, sign the mailing list. And uh, for, I guess, if you put the list together, if you put it on the website, then we can go check out the list and and see, you know, instructors so other people can, you know, get cracking, do do a little bit of yoga and see how you feel. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm so glad the Wi-Fi held out. We had concerns and they proved to be unfounded. I'm so, so glad we were able to have you uh, on the program. Uh, It was phenomenal hearing from you. I definitely want to support if we can have you back on the program or do anything to help, you know, promote and and plug the work that you all are doing. Let us know. Uh, Certainly, I will uh, exchange or forward or whatever I need to do to facilitate uh, sharing info with some of the callers that you uh, were speaking with. But just loved it. Love the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm definitely uh, inspired to continue practicing and learn more. Uh, Just please keep up the work and we hope to have you back on the program. Thanks so much. And this this platform is really, really amazing. All of your callers are so conscious and so amazing as well. And I'm looking forward to sharing like this entire platform with all of our subscribers so that they can hear 
another black person talking about yoga and talking about the things that we need to be discussing because there's just so many platforms that are talking about things that don't matter and this is the stuff that matters within blackness so i'm really grateful for being on this show as well oh thank you so much the pleasure was was all ours women of color healing retreats.com women of color healing retreats.com linked in the website uh, check out the information. Fantastic counter-racist effort, in my view. Uh, again, joining us live from Costa Rica, uh, Miss Satya X. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evening, and we will definitely be in touch. Okay. Thanks, family. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Context of white supremacy. Oh. Uh, thank you so much to the guest who recommended her and to even think I'm not sure if this program would have even happened if my residence had not flooded. I had done yoga before, but I was not thinking at all about doing yoga or returning to do yoga prior to the flood and the what motivated me to say, yes, I would go, like to go back and start doing yoga again was the stress from the flood. So uh, I guess if they, I can use a metaphor when they make lemonade, life gives you lemons, make lemonade. This might be an example uh, of that, but certainly uh, I'm so glad that we had her on the program. If we have anybody who is interested Go check out the retreat. Uh, it sounds amazing. I would definitely uh, check it out if possible. But yeah, go check it out. It, it sounds they have videos and what have you. So you can see pictures and what it looks like. See some of the people uh, who've been there. Uh, we played a video with a testimonial from some of the people speaking uh, at the beginning of the program. If you're able to go journal, take some notes, let us know how it is. But even beyond the retreat, just the self-care aspect, because that's something that I think uh, Satya X emphasized consistently self-care. Uh, Dr. Welsing talked about that. Our caller, technically speaking, in Atlanta emphasized that Dr. Welsing's message about black self-respect and, and us just taking care of ourselves and loving ourselves. So hugely important. Yoga is a can be a huge component of that. Uh, that that is something that, like I said before, I think Mr. Fuller, when he talks about how the creator can send messages sometimes, and I just interpret those signals sometimes as messages that you are where you are supposed to be in terms of being on your cosmic assignment, being on duty. When I was in class and they kept repeating self-care, kept repeating self-care, kept repeating self-care, because that's something I had been saying consistently uh, about racism, white supremacy, and it just can completely erode black, black people's ability to engage in self-care. Uh, and that can just be a part of the stress uh, and the toxicity of white supremacy. Uh, also, context, even <laughs> my instructor yesterday, context context consistently and he does it all the time context we're not just doing postures we're not just hopping in these positions they have a relationship your body everything works to get the context he says it all the time uh in class i just take these as cues you are where you are supposed to be this is what you're supposed to be doing and i cannot stress enough yoga has been a uh, huge for me at a time where i think i really would uh, have had some major health issues, mental and otherwise, just with all of the trauma and dislocation with the flood. Yoga has been enormously uh, helpful in dealing with all of this. Even just water consumption, because I'm doing yoga on a regular basis, I'm very meticulous about paying attention to how much water uh, I drink on a daily basis. That's something that I did not do before. I'm pretty sure everybody on this line right now could use an extra few ounces of water. Flint, Michigan. Uh, any of the folks who dialed in, uh, if you have a hand up. Oh, wait a minute. One, one, one last thing, and then I'll check if any of the folks who dialed in had a comment they wanted to get in. When I was in class today, uh, the instructor, non-white, she did make a comment uh, about mud. And saying, oh, we always want to get rid of the mud and get rid of the mud. And then we see people and think of them as mud. And I was thinking of Mr. Fuller, uh, where he was just talking about 
metaphors in the system of racism, white supremacy, and consistently uh, darkness, things that are, are, are dark or associated with darkness, blackness, uh, are, you know, talked about in a negative manner. But yeah, that did happen today. Anyway, uh, if any folks dialed in, uh, if you have a commentary, a word on the broadcast, what was shared, any of the information, uh, feel free, any of the folks who dialed in. May I be heard? Greetings, Red in Nevada. Thank you for taking my call once again. I definitely feel like she's probably one of my favorite um, guests that have been on the program. She definitely seems a lot less confused. Um, didn't still fully understand the whole gender thing, but um, definitely BGQ, of course. Um, but actually, while I've, um, the commentary was still progressing, I was looking up um, yoga studios here, and I tried to put in, I tried to Google uh, black yoga studios in Southern Nevada, and I, it brought up like 10 different results and uh, just going on different um, websites. And of course, none of them were black. They guess, I guess they just disregard the whole black thing. And just all of them were white. There was one where the there was a person who may have looked somewhat non-white, but still uh, very, very um, light complected. But then I did actually eventually find one at the very bottom of the list. It's actually a comedic um, yoga studio, and they do have they do. Um, there's actually a doctor who leads it, and um, she, I guess she does actually um, do more of the comedic yoga. So I'll be checking into that, and then I'll um, hopefully I'll have uh, updates in the future. That's all I'll share. Thank you. Spectacular, definitely. Let us know how that that goes. That's uh, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. I'll be waiting eagerly to hear how that goes. Uh, any any other folks have commentary that they want to share? May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Greetings, Ivy. Greetings, Gus. Uh, I just thought, as I said before, that the program was uh, very uh, constructive and informative. I thought that she was awesome, and I echo read that uh, she sound a very she sound uh, so much less confused than she. Uh, seemed very sweet, just very accommodating, just even wanting to do the list. And she was just really uh, thorough with her answers, but wasn't, you know, too wordy and all of that. And um, I wanted to know, Gus, if technically speaking is still on the line, if I could give her my email, uh, because I had tech questions for her about getting into the tech field. She was on the, she was on the program, you know, a while back, and I really appreciated um, all of her commentary and insight and just the, the tech field and how that can help black people. And the reason I wanted to just give it to her directly is so that I don't, uh, you know, take up your time and, and you trying to link us up and, and things like that. So I wanted to know if that is acceptable, if she's still online. Uh, I'm, are you still with us, technically speaking? She might not be with us. Yeah, she might not be with us. It's uh, almost 11.30 in Georgia, so getting a little late. I guess you can just uh, drop me an email, and then I can forward along. Thank you for being considerate of my time. I do appreciate it, but I think we can do you a solid. Okay, thank you so much, Gus. Uh, any other folks have a question, comment, uh, anything they want to get in? Happy to be here. Um, Go ahead, go first, five. Firefighter first, please. <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, uh, once again briefly uh, commend uh, the uh, the uh, the guest that was on, and uh, I can see where uh, a uh, retreat uh, could be something constructive, because regardless of uh, of of uh, females uh being there only uh females at the same time uh have uh contact and and uh perceivably constructive uh interaction with a lot of different types of people uh and i'm i'm, I'm specifically talking about non white black people and uh from that we all would benefit from it you know, as far as that concern, uh, I can see where something like that can be very, very uh, constructive uh, uh, based on what uh, I learned in this uh, today's session. Thank you. 
Thomas in New York. Appreciate that retired firefighter. Um, really, um, interesting because I'm, I tell you, I'm totally yoga illiterate. Um, so, um, it's definitely something that, and I'm not sure if I could do it. I'm not that flexible, but, um, I, I always, I could definitely see benefits from it. Uh, I, I asked the question because I watched a few YouTube videos of this, um, gentleman named Nature Boy. And, um, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting. He moved to Costa Rica. He had a group of people who were living with him and they were living off the land. And, um, he was, you know, pretty much, um, you know, walking around naked in the jungle. And, you know, that, I mean, they, they lived like, you know, pretty, pretty odd. So, um, you know, then I saw that the Costa Rican police um, were, were holding him there and not releasing him, and they needed the United States to um, do some things to extradite him back to the United States. So um, that's why I asked the question, because so she said that she was familiar with him and was a roommate of his. So uh, also, um, you know, it's just um, so... When, when I listen to um, our people speak and they're so confident in their speech and they're talking about, um, they're pretty much basing a lot of their logic on a theory that is, um, that have been proven. Um, like I said, the welding theory, that's law. I mean, I have not seen any case where anything has disputed that. But um, the out of Africa theory, um, that is the core root of eugenics and anthropology and Egyptology, um, a huge part of um, the, the platology. Um, it, it, it's all based on this theory. And at the core root, you know, Dalton pushing the out of the Africa theory comes up, comes up with um, eugenics, um, Darwinism. All of this comes from this theory. And our people are just so quick to, you know, everything they say is Africa, Africa. It just, um, it's like, I, I just listen to people and I'm just like, wow, this is like a total spell. Um, and I'll meet my line. Thank you, Gus. Well, any other uh, folks have commentary that they wanted to get in? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. M. Hondisi. Yes, sir. I had a question as to, in your opinion, should males and females be separated in yoga class? Let's say if we were doing this, um, let's say I tried to do this in my city. I have a whole lot of people that don't really know each other. They, they deal with each other. They have different ways of how they deal with male and female. A lot of males may not uh, treat the females correctly. So my question is, do you feel that it's better to have the males and the females separated or is it good for the balance? Uh, it might, you know, come down to, to what you want to, if you're talking about a retreat type of thing, uh, if that, you know, if that's the context that we're talking. Uh, if it's a retreat uh, as opposed to just a class, uh, I would think if it's just going to be a class, um, I don't, I mean, they do have those classes. I think, uh, our guest, she talked about the retreat and they have other classes that are just, this is just for females. I am not aware of a class that I can think of that is just for males. Although I guess such a thing probably does exist. I'm just not aware of that. I, I am more aware of classes that are exclusively for females. Uh, I can see a value in that sort of thing. Most of the classes that I've been to, everybody is together. Uh, if it's just going to be a class for like an hour or 90 minutes or whatever it is, uh, I think most people are around, you know, mixed company, males and females enough that they can behave themselves <laughs> in a group for 90 minutes. So I would just say, hey, you know, we can just all take it together and, you know, chat it up or whatever. Uh, if it's a retreat, 
Uh, and it's going to be like we're staying together for whatever, a number of days or a week or however long it is. And, you know, doing yoga as a part of that and bunking together. Again, I could see a value uh, if it's going to be an all male thing and you just want to work around, you know, masculine energy or all female thing. You want to work around feminine energy. I can see a value in that. I could also be, see a, a value uh, in having everyone together. Uh, just what kind of depend on what you're what are you pursuing? What are your intentions? Did that answer your question? Or was I off off topic? Uh, that... Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no, it answered my question. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. okay. Well, maybe to make it a, a little more clear, uh, I, I, like if it was a continuous thing and it was not a retreat or we're going out to another location, mm. but like a continuous class in the city. And I just, I just thought, you know, for, I, I've, I've, I've seen, you know, uh, things get out of hand when, um, I know males and females know how to interact, but you know, I, I've seen things get out of hand and I just oh, I'm trying okay. to figure out. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't, uh, well, I guess I'm not going to say I've never seen that, but like in the context of a yoga, uh, setting, right. Like other, other settings. Absolutely. I've seen that where things can go really bad, but in a yoga setting, like I haven't, uh, or I'm even thinking like a gym setting, right? Cause I mean, that's basically kind of a, workout type thing or if you're going to do a more meditation i mean people i wouldn't think that could go bad too too bad but uh yeah i don't know i would i would think you could have males and females together in that and it shouldn't go bad if we're just going to regulate meat for 90 minutes i would i would also think the type of people that would that would come to a yoga event might not be as prone to be rowdy but i might be mistaken in thinking that Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm. I guess people can think about that, too. Uh, if there was going to be like a weekly or regular meeting to do yoga, uh, if having everyone together, uh, black males, black females, or having it separate, you can think about that if you have a preference. I guess I'm just accustomed most of the time, you know, it's it's everybody's together. I would think, yeah, we could just all take the class together and chat about whatever or just do the postures and meditate a little bit. Anything else folks wanted to get in before we conclude? I wanted to add something. Yes, ma'am. Um, I I thought, I think it's awesome um, for her to have the free children's yoga and even just to have a retreat um, for um, black women. And she, if she's charging for this, she could get more money if she allows, you know, other groups in. And so, I just think that that's really remarkable and commendable for her. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to add that it wasn't just her commentary that I found very informative. I found yours as well, and I always learn a lot when you uh, speak on yoga. And the last thing I wanted to say is about that mud people thing or whatever it was that they said at that class. I instantly assumed that the same thing I always assume when those metaphors are employed that it was an attack, and so I felt like it was a personal attack on you and anyone else in there who was black. I could be incorrect, but I'll say that for the things that I've said about myself, this shouldn't come as a surprise that when you said that, I instantly got a, a visceral reaction. I instantly got uh, offended and, and, and angry um, that I felt that black people were being insulted, and I also don't like the renegade being insulted, and uh, I mute my line. Well, it was a non-white instructor who said the comment about the mud people. So not that that, you know, means it couldn't, couldn't be a, a personal attack, but that, you know, that certainly does factor in. But uh, I mean, I, I uh, sensed it immediately and it was said twice. That metaphor was invoked repeatedly and uh, I sensed it every time I registered it. However, or I guess I could add this. This would be my, my final comment. I wish I had brought this up when uh, Satya was with us, uh, that I do have access to a lot of non-white instructors, black male, black female, uh, non-white male, female, uh, all the time, regular, every day. Had non-white instructor today, going to have one tomorrow, had one yesterday, all the time. Um, however... White identification is extraordinarily high 
And I often feel, even when I have non-white instructors and the bulk of the non-white instructors I've had have been amazing. I get way more attention from them. They, you know, call me by my name and remember it is an amazing thing when you get a yoga instructor and you get to take classes with them on a regular basis. Uh, like one of my favorite instructors, non-white female, I get to take her class like five times a week uh, and I've been taking her class for months now. So uh, I've probably taken 20, more than 20 classes with her. When you get to see someone repeatedly like that and they get to learn your body very well. Uh, so they know where you're strong. They know where you're weak. They know where, you know, you might need help or what have you. It could be super uh, helpful just going through your practice. But cowbell, lots and lots of white identification and that also has a, a huge impact uh, on the whole environment, which I thought it would from the beginning. There's no way, if there's no way you could be a non-white yoga instructor in this area and not be white identified. Most of your job would be about soothing and helping and catering whites. As, as I've said, most of the classes, I'm the only black person. So that would be, that's what you would have to do to, for your career to flourish, get really good at that in, in the context of a yoga class. So I was not surprised. It just, you know, I often, I often feel that even with the non-white instructors, my experience would be even better if I were white, even though the not, the instructor is non-white. I hope I was clear in articulating that with that well, i probably just missed it i was just going to quickly say I, I probably you know miss what you said uh in, in terms of the person being non-white that changes a lot of things and even when i thought they were white um shortly after my visceral response kind of changed a little bit because of the things that you have said about having uh, a visceral response that we would always be angry if that were the case and uh like even the things that you said at the white ally toolkit so just thank you for all of your your help with that and i'm in my life mm -hmm. for sure for sure the i mean you don't ignore it I, it registered you know when i heard it but I'm, hey she's <sighs> tragic arrangement you know hey Anywho, uh, folks, anything else? Folks satisfied? Everybody commented. We'll be here Thursday. Workplace racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Looking forward to chatting it up. Codification. PBS documentary on Winnie Mandela. Man, I recommended it before. I said that was way more important than Marvel's trashy Black Panther, which I have no intention of seeing, but I watched uh, PBS's documentary on Winnie Mandela. Uh, it should have been watched before. You should definitely make time to view it now. It is amazing, super constructive, lots of uh, just great material where she explains uh, her philosophy on counterviolence and why she chose that. Phenomenal. Uh, check it out. It just came out uh, like weeks ago uh, for PBS. It was available online. They normally put uh, a time limit so it'll only be like you can watch it online for a few weeks uh, but I'll check to see if it's still available online I'm sure it's available in other places it's a PBS documentary so I'm sure you'll be able to go to your library or wherever locally and get it for free take it home watch it at your convenience if you so choose but it's great uh, the passing of Winnie Mandela again who I said phenomenal illustration of someone who dedicated their time energy and existence in every way possible to solving the problem that said uh again sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy i think at the women of color healing retreats there's fasting from smoking and alcohol consumption that is important dr welsing certainly would cosine uh, i think anything that we can do to preserve our brain computers and overall health would be phenomenal racists are way happier seeing us intoxicated alcohol cigarettes whatever it is as opposed to taking care of ourselves eating well eating vegetables doing some yoga so that we can think clearly come up with new concepts to immediately eradicate permanently the problem racist man racist woman racist child uh, also buckle up Every 
time we are in a vehicle. Certainly, we should be sober there as well. Uh, but buckle up every time. Let's do everything we can to minimize contact with race soldiers. Buckling up is a super easy one, whether you are a driver or passenger. That said, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cal signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Man, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Ah.